pastor um, with First Bible of Rochester this morning, so he's not here. Um, so thank you guys for being so gracious for sharing him. Um, but we've been talking a lot um, about advancing the mission, right? Our, our Acts 1-8 conference was, um, that, that was our theme this year. And so, man, God has been challenging us over and over again to advance the mission in this church body, right? But, but man, I, I, I firmly believe that we're, we're not going to advance that mission as a church, unless we, each of us advances that mission in our own hearts. Because God's, God's going to use you. You are the church. And so, man, if he wants to advance the mission here, he's got to do it in you as well. And so, man, I, we've been encouraged by that. Recently, our, our pastor has been going through um, the book of Luke. Um, so the last couple series, last, last week was Nothing Will Take Us From Ministry. Um, two weeks ago was Heal Hidden Hypocrisy. Um, and I got to tell you, that one, that one hit me pretty hard. Um, Kingdom Training Camp was the, was the one before that, and then Schooled on the Sabbath. And so, man, each and every one of these messages has really um, done, done, put the focus on, on us taking a step um, as believers, right? And if you remember um, a month or two ago, Pastor Dwayne talked about um, how, how spiritual momentum is so important in, in our Christian walks and how we have to get up and move, okay, in order for us to be used um, by God. So, so what I'd like to kind of focus on this morning is how seeing the power of God in our lives gives us that spiritual momentum, gives us that excitement, gives us that, that energy that we need in order to serve him. But first, let's pray. Father God, we love you. God, I thank you so much for every, um, every person um, that, that woke up this morning um, to hear your word. God, we, we, we want to hear from you, Lord. We, um, God, we, we know that, um, Father, our, our spiritual lives, God, are, are all driven by you. Um, God, uh, Philippians 2.13 talks about how it's you that works in us both to will and to do of your good pleasure, God. So if, if we're to be um, better followers of you after today, it's got to be you. And so, Lord, would you, would you help us to hear from you, um, God, and to respond to your word this morning, Lord. Um, we ask these things in your precious son, Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're going to kind of kick off this morning. Um, I'd kind of like to ask you guys the question. Um, is there a time in your life that you can share that where you've witnessed the power of God? And so I'd like to hear from you guys. What are some times in your life where you've witnessed the power of God? Yeah.
Thank you so much for sharing that. Amen. Uh, just to kind of, uh, I can't summarize that real quick, but um, but he was essentially sharing that, man, he had an opportunity where he felt tugged by the Holy Spirit, like we talked about last night, um, to go pray for a woman and how that, that woman had just received a diagnosis. Um, so, man, praise the Lord. Thank you so much for sharing that. Amen. Anybody else? Yeah. Amen. Thank you so much for sharing. Amen. <clears throat> Is there one in the back? Yeah, let's hear it, Debbie. High school and struggled through college. In 2019, he asked Christ into his heart and came down and said, Mom, I truly have a Savior now. Every day... I watched that young man read the Bible. Tonight he is um, he's becoming involved. He's going to Mid uh, Midtown. You guys haven't seen him, but he's at Midtown. He's becoming very involved with the international students. They do a lot down there. Amen. And he went to something last night, and he came home, and he said, these three Muslim young men have never been to a Christmas show. So I'm going to take them tonight, I'm going to pick them up, and I'm going to take them to a Christmas show. It seems early, but Colonial Presbyterian is having it. And he said, I believe I'm strong enough my doctrine that I can go. And I said, it's, it's a good church, but if those men are interested and never been to a Christmas show, and he goes, I had the opportunity to talk to him last night. My mom heart went, oh, he doesn't even know these men, and he's picking these men up. But God's been in charge of that man's yes. life so long. And to every mother, father in here, never stop praying for your children because the power of God is in my son. Yes. Amen. Thank you and so I much. And I know for many sharing. of you have prayed. Amen. There's one up here, I think, Rick. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Rick. So I've already told you this one in youth, but I'm going to reiterate it. <laughs> so I have this friend named Joji, and he goes to the Art Institute of Kansas City. And we met online and stuff like that. And not only was he a Satanist, but he was also a Luciferian. Um, <clears throat> and I just gave a small um, sermon to him almost and preached to him. And he was not interested, clearly. Um, but a week later, he texted me and he said, hey, I'm at church, and I wanted you to know that I wanted to stop by because of how passionate you were of it. Yeah. 
and I want you to realize the impact you had on that. And he got baptized. Amen. That's incredible. Praise the Lord. Amen. Man, I don't, we might just, can we, we could probably just go home. That's probably about as good of a message as you're going to hear. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Thank you guys so much for sharing. And man, I, that, guys, I, you know this as well as anybody, those, those things when God does those incredible things in your life, man, doesn't it just feel like you can run through a wall? after those experiences, right? Like, I mean, it just, it, it has a way of just clarifying and reminding us of what's important in our lives, right? And I, I received a phone call from one of my family members the other day that was, that was kind of struggling. And man, I, it just, like, that next day was one of my most prayerful days ever, you know? Because I was so focused on what, on what God was doing that, man, just all the, all the other things around me just didn't seem to matter quite as much. And so, man, that's what I'd kind of like to talk about this morning is how Man, we as believers, we need to witness the power of God on a regular basis. Because when we do, it energizes us. It gives us that spiritual momentum, as Pastor Dwayne was talking about. That, man, it, it, that gives us the motivation to keep going. That throughout trials, throughout tribulations, all of those things, we, we have, that, we have that, that momentum to keep going because we've witnessed the power of God. And so, man, I, we, we got to ask this question, though. If the power of God is so incredible in our lives, why does it seem that God sometimes reserves it. Like, why doesn't God just say, hey, every Wednesday at 2 p.m., I'm gonna show you my power and that should sustain you for the rest of the week, right? Why doesn't that happen? And at, in order to kind of look at that, I'd like to kind of look at the first mention um, of power in the Bible. So if you wanna turn over to Genesis chapter 36, you're welcome to. Um, but if you haven't heard that term before, um, first mention is, I'm essentially um, referring to the first time that the word power shows up in your Bible. And what, what we've seen in studying the Bible is that a lot of times that first mention helps define that word for us, okay? So we, we see how the word is used in context, and then it gives us a platform for how we can understand that word um, throughout the rest of the Bible, okay? So if we're looking at um, Genesis 31, so verse 6 is the very first time that power is mentioned. And it says, and ye know that with all my power, I have served your father. Now, this is a reference, okay, to Jacob talking about how he had, um, how he was about to leave um, Laban and Rachel. So if you, if, that, um, if you haven't heard that story in a while, essentially Jacob's looking for a wife, right? And so he goes and he finds Rachel. And Rachel's incredible, and so he, he goes to, to um, Rachel's dad, Laban, and he says, hey, I would like to marry your daughter. Well, Laban comes back and says, hey, if you want to marry my daughter, you have to serve me for seven years. And Jacob's okay with that. <laughs> and, and that we even have the romantic verse um, that, that Jacob says that it was as but a few days because of his love for Rachel. So we can all say, aw. Um, and if your husband says there's no romanticism in the Bible, he's wrong. Um, but, man, when that seven years is up, okay, he gets to go marry Rachel, right? And there's a switcheroo that goes on. They're, they're, they're getting married, and all of a sudden, um, they're, they're about to consummate their marriage. Well, Laban sends in his daughter Leah instead of Rachel. Leah was the firstborn. Okay, and so it was, there was their custom that she would be married first, right? And so Jacob's obviously a little bit mad, okay? But he, he's, he agrees to work another seven years so that he can then have Rachel. So he works another seven years, and after that's up, he, he ends up marrying Rachel as well. Now, after that, there, Jacob's decide, okay, I'm out of here. You've made me work here for 14 years so that I can marry your daughter, okay? I'm out. And he then... Um, he, he tells Laban that he wants to go, but Laban doesn't want him to go. And so he, he says, hey, I'm going to go, but I'm, I, all of this, this cattle and everything that I've helped you amass, everything that God's blessed you for, I'm only going to take the spotted and the speckled ones, okay? And, and even Jacob has some deception in there too because he does this weird thing where he uh, makes it to where the, the spotted and the speckled were all the biggest and strongest ones as well. Okay, so there's two things that I would like for us to look at, the, look at with this first mention. And the first one is that God often uses power in our lives as a stamp of approval. See, when Jacob was there serving Laban, um, we, we see a pretty cool reference in, in chapter 30, verse 27, where Laban says that the Lord has blessed me for thy sake. So Laban says, hey, all the blessings that God's blessed me with, it, it's kind of because of you, Jacob. I wasn't getting blessed like this before you showed up. And so we see that God has a stamp of approval on Jacob's life, and he's, he's blessing him wherever he goes. 
But on the flip side of that, we also see that that, that power can be used for deceit. Laban had power where he said, hey, you want to marry my daughter? Okay, I'm going to get something from you because of that. And Jacob had all this influence and power, and he said, hey, I'm going to take a bunch of the best cattle for myself, right? And so, man, when we're talking about it, why does God seem to, seem to hold back on his power? I think it's for those two reasons. We have to ask ourselves, first of all, is, is the stamp of approval of, of, of God on my life, am I worthy of that? Is, does my life, if, if God's blessing the socks off of my life and he sees and, and, he, and other people see him doing that, will they look at my life and go, ooh, I should start doing those things because, man, this person's being blessed of God. And if they do those things, are they going to be successful? Are they going to be pleasing to the Lord? Dad, we had a really cool opportunity a couple weeks ago where um, Brian Calloway got a group of, of, um, of church members together and we all went to Independence Center um, and we shared the gospel with people. There was about 30 of us. Um, it was so sweet. So we went down to the, to the food court. Um, we all prayed together and then we just kind of dispersed all throughout the uh, Independence Center and, and tried to start conversations, invite people to church and whatnot, right? Well, at, we all kind of went in our little groups of four or five. Well, I, I went out with a couple students, and as I'm walking by, I already see Brian talking to somebody. It was probably about 30 seconds after we said amen, and it was about 50 feet away from where we said amen. And guess what? When I, when I talked to him on Monday, he was able to lead, the Lord, or lead that man to the Lord. So praise the Lord. Now, God decided to see it fit to put a stamp of approval on our leader that day. Brian had orchestrated the whole meeting, got everything together, got the Bibles all together, and, and did all the communication. And so God decided to bless him with a big old stamp of approval that day to say, hey, you guys are all following somebody who's a man of God, who's serious about sharing the gospel. And we saw the power of God on his life that day. And praise the Lord. Now, can, are, are we that same person? Is there going to be a benefit if God puts a stamp of approval on our lives for the people around us? Because if not, he's probably going to hold back. Because he doesn't want the stamp of approval on people's lives that aren't faithful to him. Now, we also have to, have to ask ourselves about this deceitfulness thing, right? Because we all know, if you've been a believer for a few years, you all know the power of God can be faked. Okay? In, um, in Matthew chapter 10, we see the disciples getting sent out. And it said, when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now, God had, had, to, had to put a stamp of approval on those disciples. They were going out to share the gospel with all the nations. And he wanted to take them and say, hey, I've separated you all. You guys are my, are, are, are my, are my dudes to go share the gospel, right? So he put a stamp of approval so that everybody around them could see these are God's men. Now, on the, on the flip side, could they have used that for deceit? Yeah, and one did. Judas decided to use his stamp of approval to steal money. And so Jesus called 12 and one of them d decided to double cross him and use God's power for, for deceit. Man, is that not a challenge for us to ask ourselves it, it, if God put his stamp of approval through his power on my life, am I going to be faithful with it? See, I, a lot of you guys grew up as, um, as playing sports and stuff, right? And I remember growing up, I was, I was a believer, but I was playing basketball, and I kept thinking like, ooh, maybe I'll make the NBA one day, right? A lot of you younger people may still have that dream, right? And I kept thinking like, well, God, I, I promise if I make it to the NBA, I'll still, I'll still serve you. When I do interviews, I'll, I'll talk about you and all these things, right? But the reality of it is he didn't choose to bless me in that way, probably because I wasn't good enough, but probably for other reasons too, right? Because perhaps when I got to that level, I wouldn't have been as faithful as I thought I would be in my head. Perhaps all that temptation and playing games on Sunday and all those things, right? Perhaps those, th those temptations would have gotten the best of me. And so, man, we have to ask ourselves, are, what are we going to do with the power that God decides to put on our lives? We, we see another example of, um, of, of that fakeness in, in 2 Timothy 3, 5, it says, and when he had called, or sorry, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such, turn away. And so he's speaking of believers who look godly. They're doing all the right things. They're checking all the boxes. But when it gets down to it, there's no power in their lives. See, there's some fakeness going on. When they read the word of God, it's, it's, it's so that they can say, hey, I did it. And when they, like Jesus talked about with the Pharisees, they, they stand in the streets praying so that they can be seen, not because they want to have a conversation with their holy God. 
And man, we can, we can fake this too. We can, we can build up these things in our head and say, man, I'm such a good person. Man, I, I, I do all these things, man. I, you, you guys should all follow me because, because I'm following the Lord. But the reality of it is God's gonna reserve the power that he's given for those of you that, that are gonna stay faithful. And for those of you that are, despite all the temptations in your life, are you gonna stay faithful to God even through the temptations, even through the times when you're exalted? Even through the times when, when, there's, when there's trials in your life, are you going to stay faithful to God? Because if he puts that power in your life, it's going to draw some attention. And so we also have to ask ourselves, what limits the power of God in our lives, right? And, and you guys could all answer this. I think probably the number one answer to this is probably sin, right? Man, if, if you're here today and you're, and you're struggling with habitual sin, you know that when you screw up and you do whatever it is you know you shouldn't be doing, you feel pretty worthless that next day, don't you? See, Satan takes that opportunity, he jumps on you and he says, yes, you messed up. I'm gonna hold you down and, and, and keep, my throat, or my, keep my foot on your throat so that you stay ineffective, so that you stay full of shame and so that God can't use you because you don't, you, you don't think that God can use you because of your mess up. Or perhaps it's just through disobedience. Maybe, maybe you are just, you've, you've made a habit in your life, I always warn our students of this, maybe you've made a habit in your life of saying no to God. And the reality of that is, if you say no to God on a regular basis, it's going to get easier and easier. See, the first time, I remember the first time I said no to God, I was terrified for the whole week. Because I was like, I don't know, maybe God's going to strike me with a lightning bolt. I don't know what's going to happen, right? But then the next time I said no to God, it was a little easier and a little easier. And the scary thing about that is, man, you've, you've got to make a decision to say yes to God so that he can have his, his effect in your life. God has, a, God has a plan for you, and if you say no at every turn, how is he supposed to guide your life? How is he supposed to orchestrate things for your good if you're not saying yes to him on every occasion? Or maybe it's just the noise. Man, I, it is an unbelievable how much noise is a part of our culture. I, um, Courtney Lutz really challenged me a couple years ago. She, anytime she drives anywhere in her car on the way to work, on the way to, um, to get food, whatever, she always drives in silence. And so I've, I've kind of taken up that habit because what I've noticed is that, man, I, for me, it's whenever I drive to work in the morning, I, I, no, no podcast, no music, no nothing. I'm just sitting and I'm driving and I'm listening. But man, I can't tell you how many times God's spoken to me just driving through the back roads of Grain Valley, Blue Springs. Man, do we, do we allow God to, to remove some of the noise in our lives so we can actually hear from him? Because, man, it, we, we have to ask ourselves if we're giving him the opportunity to do that. And so, man... We know that, that God's called us to have, that God, God wants to show power in our lives. He wants to give you that stamp of approval, right? And so, man, we have to ask ourselves, what are the things that, that God talks about in his word that are associated with that power? And I think the first one is the power of his word. See, God, over and over again, he shows, he shows us that he associates his word with power. Check out Psalm 29.4. It says, the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Okay, that is not the Lord on your screen. Okay, that is a, a young man. He's a senior in our youth group named Noah Brown. Um, and so this was a picture that we took at camp. He took a selfie. Um, it was with my, we don't allow phones at, at camp, so this was with my phone. Um, but he took a selfie of him. Do, we were doing a skit on the very last day of camp. And so what we were trying to show with this skit is we, we were trying to bring up the scenario that, man, Say you've been praying for something consistently over and over, to, over and over again to the Lord and asking him for something. In Noah's case, maybe it's, hey, I'm graduating from high school in a couple months. What am I going to do next, God? What do you have for me next? So, let, so Noah, we put him in this. Once again, this was a made-up skit, okay? But we put him in this scenario and we said, okay, today's the day that God wants to tell Noah what it is he wants him to do after high school. See, Noah doesn't know that. He's been sleeping all night. But when he wakes up, he does what so many of us often do, including myself, and he starts scrolling and scrolling. And all of a sudden, you've been scrolling for 45 minutes, and you realize, oh, I'm late for work. I better go. And so Noah, once again, skit, made up. But Noah woke up that morning, started scrolling. He had intentions to read the Word of God, but the, the scrolling got in his way, and, well, he didn't end up doing that. And so now he's got to get off to school, right? And he has intention, hey, maybe I'll, maybe I'll read the word of God during study hall. But man, there was, there, there was so many people to talk to at study hall and somebody had a cool fight story to tell. I hate those fight stories. Okay, but all of a sudden it's the end of the day and he still hasn't spent time with God. 
And so then when he gets home from school, he's like, all right, I'm home from school. No more distractions. I'm ready to spend time with God. But guess what? He gets a text from his friend. And it says, Fortnite, question mark. And he's like, ah, he beat me really bad last week. I, I, I got to get him back. And so he starts playing Fortnite, right? And it's Wednesday night, so he's got church tonight. And it's, it's 6 o'clock. He needs to start going. And so he turns off Fortnite and says, hey, I got to go. But then next he gets a text from his girlfriend that says, hey, can I come over? Um, let, let's go watch a movie. And so he, he said, he's not going to say no to that, obviously, right? And so that she comes over and they watch Finding Nemo, I think was our, right? Finding Nemo? I think that's what we said. Okay. And they just innocently watch Finding Nemo on the couch, right? And, okay, she's got to go now. And now it's, he's, all right, it's like 8.30, I miss church. Let me, let me take some time to, to talk to my Lord and Savior, right? But then he gets another text and it says, hey, Fortnite, question mark. And so he says, dude, this guy beat me eight times in a row. I've got to get him back. And so he hops back on the sticks and all of a sudden it's 11.45 and it's time to go to bed. And all day long, God was waiting to talk to him waiting to give him the answer he's been praying for for weeks, for months. But that day came and went without him giving the God of the universe the opportunity to talk to him. See, I wonder how many of those days go, through, go on throughout our weeks. How many days is God begging to talk to us, begging and saying, hey, I, I've got something to tell you. I've got something to encourage you with. But we, there's too many things to look at. There's too many things to be distracted by. And so that day comes and goes, and the next day comes and goes, Man, what we end up doing is then we go, man, God just won't answer my prayer. And God's up there saying, no, I want to answer your prayer, but you're not listening to me. Can you imagine how frustrating that would be? You as parents know it's frustrating when you, tell, when you got to tell your, your, your kids something and they just will not listen, isn't it? Man, our Heavenly Father unfortunately has that same struggle with us. And so, man, the, we, we can't talk about the power of God without a Hebrews 4.12. It says, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So once again, guys, we see that the word of God is powerful. There's power right there. If you're wondering, how do I have power in my life? It's right there. You need to spend time in the word of God. It's got to be a part of us because if it's not, man, we limit the power of God in our lives by, by not allowing him to have that opportunity. And, man, I've been studying a guy named Balaam, okay, for, for I, I think I spent a, a day a couple of weeks ago. And, man, one thing really jumped out to me in Balaam's life. So if you want to turn there, the story of Balaam is in uh, Numbers chapter 22. Now, if you remember the story, Balaam was a prophet of God. And he, he, was, he was a prophet on behalf of Israel. Now, one day there was a king named Balak. Okay, this gets really confusing. Balak is the king. Balaam is the prophet. Okay, don't forget. Balak, king. K for king. Balaam, I don't know what the M stands for, but he's the prophet. Okay, so Balak all of a sudden looks around one day and he says, hey, Israel is getting too powerful. There's too many of you. Similar to what happened in Egypt, right? There's too many of you. I, we, have to, we, have to, we have to stop. We have to stop this, this advance of Israel. And so what, what Balak does is he goes to the prophet of God, Balaam, and he says, hey, I want you to curse Israel. Now, what, what Balaam does from there, and you'll see it um, in, in, chapter, in chapter 22, is he goes to God and he says, hey, God, do you want me to do what Balaam said? And we see God's answer in, in verse 12. So Numbers 22, verse 12. And God said unto Balaam, thou shalt not go with them, Thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. So there's our answer, right? He's told, don't go with them and don't curse Israel. But Balak doesn't give up. He says, hey, I'm going to send even more important people to you, and they're going to offer you all the riches you could ever want. Whatever you want, I'll give to you if you curse Israel. And so they come back to Balaam, and Balaam says, okay, let me go back to God and see what he says now. And we see God's answer in verse 20. And God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them, but yet the word which I shall say unto, unto thee, thou shalt do. Now we have a problem here. God changed his mind, right? He got, Balaam went to God one time and said, Hey, should I curse Israel? Should I go with this men? And and. God came back and said, don't go with them and don't curse them. 
Well, then he comes back a second time, and he, the, the answer is different. He says, hey, you can go with them, but don't curse Israel and do whatever I say. Whatever, only the things that I tell you to say are you supposed to say. Now, I heard my, my this is one of the passages my, I have my, my dad preaching um, on, and man, I, I love the way he says it. He talks about how the first time God answers Balaam, it's God's perfect will. God, God communicates with Balaam and says, this is exactly what I want you to do. The second time is what he called Baal, or, uh, God's per- per- permissive will. God's permissive will. And I think to understand that, we have to ask ourselves, why in the world did Balaam go to God to ask if he, ha- if he should curse Israel? That would be like somebody coming up to me and said, hey, I want you to punch your kid in the face. And me being like, okay, God, should I punch my kid in the face? I've been given that answer already. I don't have to ask God that. God, should I murder this person? Go check out the Ten Commandments, bro. It's not in there. Okay? We already have that answer, don't we? And so why does Balaam go? And, and we see this. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 15, when it's describing Balaam, it talks about somebody who loved the wages of unrighteousness. So why did Balaam go back the second time to ask again? Man, perhaps it's because he really wanted what was offered to him. Maybe he really desired that God would change his mind so that he could have these wages of unrighteousness. And man, when I see that in Balaam's life, I wonder if I do that too. I wonder if sometimes I seek the Lord and I'm asking him a question, but really in the back of my head, there's only one answer I'm willing to hear. If God says to go here or there, if he says to go there, maybe I'll obey you, God. But if you say to go here, yeah, I'll definitely obey you. Do we read the word of God with, with, a, with, a, finite opera, with, with a finite limit of how many things God can say to you? Have you given God permission to say to you whatever he wants to say to you? See, I think about that with, with that evangelism trip to the Independence Center because, man, I, I'm reminded over and over again when I decide to share the gospel, most of the time God teaches me. Most of the time God says, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to humble you a little bit here, Josh, because you need it. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a struggle. I'm gonna, we, we talked about this in, in Mexico City, Sean. Like many times I'm the one that learns. God's showing me how to share my faith better because of stepping out and doing it, right? And so, man, maybe, maybe every time you, you, you read, the word, God, read the word of God, God's got something to tell you. But you're not willing to hear what he has to tell you. So you're like Balaam and you're going to keep asking and keep asking until, man, you're just hoping that, that you get the answer you want. See, I think when we, when, we, when we need to hear from the word of God, we have to be okay with whatever he tells us, with whatever answer he gives you. See, our, our youth group is, is based off the parable of, of the sower. Um, it's called Primed, and it, it, we talk about how um, that, that last verse after the parable of the sower talks about how we're supposed to take heed, therefore how ye hear. So I have to ask myself, every time I approach the word of God, how am I hearing? See, because most of the time what I do is I spend 30 minutes in the word of God, I don't hear anything, and I go, well, guess you didn't have anything for me today, God. Instead of taking a second to look, hmm, how did I hear today? How did I approach the word of God today? Did, okay, this is my pet peeve. If you do this, no shame, but I can't do this. I can't read the word of God on my phone because what happens to me is I get an alert. And guess what? I go check that alert. And then I get a message, and I guess I go check that message. So essentially, God's having a conversation with me, and every five minutes, I'm looking away or check, right? The God of the universe wants to talk to me, but I'm not even looking him in the face. How is God supposed to, how is God supposed to communicate to me if I'm not even paying attention? We have to take heed, therefore, how we hear. Another one that I've learned over the last few years is that, man, if something sticks out to you, kind of like the story of Balaam, go after it. See, because sometimes we read this story and we go, oh, no, that's a contradiction. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shut it. I don't want to read that anymore, right? And we just walk away thinking, oh, maybe the, maybe the Bible does have contradictions. Instead of perhaps God puts those stories in the Bible to get our attention. We should dig in. We should figure out what in the world's going on so that our, strength is, is, or our faith is strengthened in the word of God and not damaged. And so, man, I, I have to ask myself this all the time, but how... How am I hearing the word of God? If I were to evaluate my time with the word of God each week, how, how did I do? 
Because God's going to remain faithful. God's going to speak to you. But it's up to us. How are we going to hear? And so the second one, we've talked about the power of the word of God. This next, this next one's similar, right? But it's the power of the gospel. And man, you guys talked about it. The, 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 the gospel is literally power. There's a beautiful verse in Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so, man, if we want to define power, this verse literally says it's the gospel. And so if we're going to talk to other people, we should share the gospel because that is the power in their lives. My testimony doesn't always feel powerful. Sometimes I share it and I'm like, I don't know if that did anything. But I, I promise you, we have a promise from God's word that the gospel is power. And so, man, we've been talking about in the youth group, if you're sharing your testimony, can you sprinkle in the gospel in there? Because as we share gospel truths, we, we, the, the power of God is, is in there. And now God can work in your friends' lives because you've allowed him to by sharing the gospel with other people. And man, Acts 1.8 is another one. But after ye shall, re after ye sh but ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Guys, the gospel is literally power. And so if, we, if we're wondering why we don't have power in our lives, we have to ask ourselves, am I sharing the gospel with other people? And if you're not, can I give you a little tip? This is something that, that man, I've, I, that it's really been a blessing to me over the past few years. It, it started a couple years ago. I was taking a, a Bible Institute class with Maddox, and we got done with the Bible Institute class and stood in the parking lot and talked for 20 minutes. It, it felt like a long time, right? And the whole time we were talking about the evangelism and how important it is. Well, all of a sudden, as if God was pointing a finger, we both looked up at the sports park and there were three young people up there playing. And I looked and I was like, Maddox and I kind of looked at each other and we're like, we kind of have to go, right? <laughs> we just spent 20 minutes talking about how important evangelism is. And then God sent us three people. Let's go talk to them. Okay, so we walked up there and nobody got saved that day. Okay, but we still felt like we obeyed God. We went up there, we asked them about church, we asked them about the Lord. They all went to church and we had a good conversation. And I'll never forget when we were walking back down to the parking lot after that, Maddox looked at me and he said, now I understand why God sent the disciples out two by two. Because if we'd have been walking up there and I'd have been by myself, I'd have chickened out. But he didn't because I was standing there next to him. And perhaps I'd have been chickening out had he not been standing there next to me, right? But God calls us to, to, to tell people about the gospel and sometimes we need some accountability. Sometimes we need to be reminded that, that God is asking us to do this. We, we talk about accountability a lot with reading your Bible and staying away from sin, but what about evangelism? Can you commit to tell somebody about Jesus every week? And can you go to one of your friends and say, hey, will you ask me next Sunday if I shared the gospel this week? Because I, I want to be held accountable. Can you do that? So we kind of do that in the youth group. And I'm, a, I'm not going to lie, if, if it's Friday, I'm like, dude, I don't have anything to share on Sunday. I've been... I've not been focused on the Lord. And so, man, I, I got to go. I, I got to go tell somebody. Can, can you get in that habit to where you have that accountability, to where you're sharing the gospel on a regular basis? Because the gospel is power. And so the last one we'll look at is the power of his resurrection. So Philippians 3.10, this is one of my favorite verses. It says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. And so you guys shared it when, man, Debbie, you talked about your son. When you guys witness the power of the resurrection in each other, it is powerful, isn't it? See, when we're talking about the power of the resurrection with Jesus, we're talking about the fact that he raised from the dead, right? But when we're talking about the power of the resurrection with us, that resurrection is a changed life. That is God taking somebody that's here and bringing them all the way to here to where they're not recognizable anymore. They're not the same person. They're a new creature. They walk in newness of life. And when that happens, people notice. You guys, you guys could probably point a finger at the person in this room who's been changed dramatically recently. Praise the Lord. That is so sweet. And man, we have, we have one of the best examples I've ever, I've ever seen in Bobby Bonner. That man was a drunk. That man was a terrible uh, husband by his own account, right? I'm not telling any secrets, okay? <laughs> but man, God got a hold of his life, radically changed him, 
had him quit professional baseball and go serve the Lord in Zambia for 20 years. That's a big change. And every time I invite Bobby to come speak at softball or when he's speaking in investors, I've noticed people listen to that man. And it's because the power of the resurrection is on his life. That's a changed man. And when people look at him and see who he used to be and who he is now, they're going to listen to him and do the things that he says. Because they trust God's power. That God, he's got a big old stamp of approval of God's power on his life. Guys, we have the same example with Paul in scripture, right? Paul went from persecuting, killing Christians to now all of a sudden he's before King Agrippa sharing his testimony. And King Agrippa responds, thou almost persuadest me to be a Christian. Why? Because the power of the resurrection was on Paul's life. It was all over. You couldn't miss it. And man, we, the, the one that's been encouraging me before, or, or the last couple of weeks is, is Zacchaeus Cease. That he's, a, he's a freshman in our, in our youth department. And man, I've been, I've been, we've been going to Chick-fil-A a couple times a month. And every time I meet with this kid, he's got something new to share with me about what God's doing in his life. The first week, it was, we just seemed to always be reading the same chapter this, every week. He was reading a chapter and I was studying that same chapter. The next week when we met, he, just, he was sharing that, man, every single week I pray for something and it happens. And then I pray for something else and it happens. And most recently, God's been using him to invite people to church. Every single time I meet with this kid, he's got a new opportunity to share with me that, that God's doing in his life. He, God is using him to, to help students put down their sin, to get involved in church, to, to step out of anxiety. God's using him in mighty ways. And man, me as a youth guy, that makes me want to run through a wall every single week. Because I get to witness this stuff. I feel so blessed that I get to hang out with young people and get to see that rapid growth. See, it seems like some of us old folks, it doesn't, the, the growth isn't as rapid, is it? But man, when we see these young people that are growing at such a rapid rate, the power of God is there and it's so encouraging. It's such a blessing to see. And so man, there, there's a lot of different types of people in here. And so we, we are all called, right, to have the power of God in our lives. And so some of you, if you're sitting here today and you're like, I, I don't know that I have a testimony. I don't know that God's ever been powerful in my life. Perhaps today you're still living in your before. See, we've been talking about sharing our testimony in the youth group and we talk about how there's a before, there's a what happened, and then there's an after. And that's a good little framework for how to share your testimony, right? But some students in there, they're still living in their before. And so if they're trying to write out their testimony, they're struggling. They can do the before pretty easy, but the rest of it, I don't really know, right? And so maybe that's you today. Maybe you need to call upon the Lord to save you. And maybe the power of the gospel is going to be what, what changes it for you. Maybe just hearing the fact that you are separated from God because of your sin and that you are doomed for eternity because of that, but God made a way. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, on the, on the, on the cross to die for us so that we don't have to be separated from God because of our sins. Isn't that power? Yes. The power of the gospel can be alive in your life today. You can end your before today and you can walk in newness of life and be that new creature. And maybe some of you, you're like, dude, I, I get you. God's power is on my life today and I'm so thankful for it. Can I remind you with what I've been having to remind myself with recently? First Peter 5, 6, 5, 6 says to humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he, will, that he may exalt you in due time. So each and every time God shows his power in your life, guess what? It's your turn to humble yourself. It's your turn to say, hey, the things that led up to this power being shown in my life, I gotta go back and do those things again. I gotta spend time in God's word. I gotta spend time in prayer. I gotta share the gospel with other people. I have to say yes to God so that he can resurrect my life and make me a new creature. We have to ask ourselves that. Now, for those of you that are like, man, I don't know that I see the power of God in my life. I feel stagnant. It just it doesn't feel like anything's ever happening. The things I pray for just don't seem to happen. Can I, can I ask you to read Psalm 139? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. See that stamp of approval that God gives with his power? If he puts it on somebody that, that's not ready for it, it's, it, it's, it's distracting to other people around them. Because if you're not somebody who's following the Lord faithfully and God's got something he wants to change in you before he's ready to put that stamp of approval with that power, 
said, man, let him do it. And trust him that he is going to accomplish those things, but you have to let him do it. See, I, I never, there, there's not very many days when I'm feeling amazing, God's power is on my life, and then I'm, I go home that day and I'm like, dude, I wonder what's wrong with me. Those days usually happen when God's power is not on my life. And so perhaps you need to ask that question of, man, what, what is in my heart that's preventing God's power in my life? And if we ask that question, I think God's going to answer us because God has a desire to change you. And so the only way we're going to see that is if God hold ba- hold backs his power, holds back his power a little bit so that we start to examine ourselves. And guys, the other thing that we have to be encouraged with, if you as a believer are trying to follow the Lord and you're not seeing God's power, will you just stick with it? We just sang for, for, for several minutes about God's faithfulness, didn't we? So if we did, we need to be reminded of that each and every day. God is faithful to you. If you're doing all the right things, if you're spending time with God, if you're, if you're having sweet time with him, first of all, that's your power too, okay? But second of all, just be patient. See, the, that 1 Peter 5, 6 doesn't just say he's gonna exalt you. It says he'll exalt you in due time and it's in his perfect timing. And so if you're stagnant, it doesn't feel like anything's happening, but you're doing what you feel like God wants you to do, stay faithful. Stay faithful, because then when God puts the power on your life, all that time of waiting is gonna be worth it. Genesis 24, 27, we'll, we'll kind of close here, but this is, man, this is one of my favorite verses. This is um, a servant, um, okay? He was, um, he was gone to find a wife for Isaac, right? So he gets sent out, he goes to find the, the wife, Rebecca, and he starts praying of all these different things that, that he wants God to, to lead him towards the right woman for his servant, right? And so he's praying that um, all these different things, well, all of a sudden, all of these prayers start to come to pass. And this is his response to, God's, to him seeing God working. And it's, check out that underlined portion. I being in the way, the Lord led me. I being in the way, the Lord led me. And man, that, that hits me deep because... If, if I want God's power in my life, I gotta be in the way. I gotta say yes to God as many times in my life as, 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 as possible so that I'm in the way whenever the Lord decides to, to, to bless my life. When, I, when, the, when the times are coming where he's gonna show his power, am I gonna be there to see it? See, maybe God wanted to show you his power last Thursday, but you weren't there to see it. I being in the way, the Lord led me. So guys, as we, as we conclude today, man, I, I just, I wanna encourage you that seeing the power of God, witnessing the power of God, it'll embolden you to do whatever he ha- it is that he's asking you to do. But we have to be faithful to do all the things that lead to the power of God. We have to be faithful to pray. We have to be faithful to spend time in his word. We have to be faithful to say no to the things of this world so we can live a resurrected life. And we have to be faithful to share the gospel with other people. And so, man, w- w- will you commit with me this week to say, God, I, I want to see your power on my life, and I'm willing to do whatever it is that you're asking me to do in order to see it. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. God, we just want to say thank you, first of all, for your word. God, thank you for the opportunity to read it. And God, would you give us um, your Holy Spirit, um, God, the, the, the understanding of the Holy Spirit so that we can read your word and apply it to our lives and do whatever it says. God, we want to say that we, we want to we, we be a new creature in you. We want to walk in newness of life, God. So would you give us that opportunity this week? God, would you hold us accountable to share the gospel with somebody this week? Would you hold us accountable to spend time in your word so that we can witness the, the power? And, and would, would you hold us accountable, God, to say no to this world so that we can live a resurrected life that honors you? As we finish, will you stand to your feet?